All right, so the final shape of DNA is a double helix. The sides, or some people ask me, the backbone is what it's sort of called, is the sugar and the phosphate. And they're connected to each other by what are called phosphodiester bonds. It's probably unlikely you'd be asked on a test what a phosphodiester bond looks like, but I did sketch in here really quick. So this is where the phosphate connects to the carbons. This here is a phosphodiester bond. It's basically the bond if this is actually, this is the ester part, and this is the bond. So I guess technically the bond would be here. This here, and this one here, where the phosphate is binding. Because an ester, if you remember, was, I taught you with a carbon, but a carbon bonded to an oxygen, bonded to something. And so the phosphate basically forms an ester, and then this bond and this bond connecting it to the carbons are phosphodiester bonds. Again, I've never really seen it asked on a test. I wouldn't ask you on a test. But this is a covalent bond, which is a very strong bond, unlike what holds the bases together, because they're held together by hydrogen bonds. And I mentioned on Friday, do you remember how many hydrogen bonds connect A to T? Right, so it's two bonds connecting A to T, and then how many C to G? And then three C to G. So you can identify whether it's an A to T connection or a C to G connection, by whether it's two bonds or three bonds. And then the other thing I had told you was angels are pure, and if you can remember angels are pure, A and G are your purines, which would be the ones with double rings. So if we go to the next slide, um, and this should be, oh, and then again, those are hydrogen bonds, those dotted lines. But again, you should have, have that part. Okay, so this is where we, where this is new. So the strands in DNA, we call them anti-parallel. And the reason why they're called anti-parallel is because they're parallel to each other, but they run in what we call opposite directions. One of them runs in what we call the five prime to three prime direction. This little dash here, because some people were asking me the other day, what does that mean? Three feet? Five feet? This is pronounced prime, or it means prime. So when, when um, if you've ever taken organic, any organic chemistry, like if you took AP Chem last year, you would have had a little organic at the end. You may have learned how to number carbons. If you never took AP Chem, you probably never had to number carbons. But here's the deal. First thing you need to know is they get really lazy in organic chemistry, and they don't put the letter C for carbon everywhere there's a carbon. So, so what, what you would see, what, what's really going on here, I should say, is that there's a carbon in every corner of the sugar molecule. So if this is deoxyribose, technically there's a carbon in each of these corners. But to save space, because it gets really busy if you have to write out every carbon and every hydrogen. So they just make like a bend. And you're supposed to know that each of these bends is a carbon. The same is true for the nitrogen bases. They also, if you remember, they look kind of like this, and they had like nitrogen in certain spots. Every bend that doesn't actually have a, an N is automatically a carbon. So it's sort of their way of shortening up things in organic chemistry. The way you number carbons, because they, they are officially numbered, and each one has sort of an address, is you number them clockwise. So starting with the oxygen, if I number the carbons here, this would be carbon number one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, and this one at the top would be carbon number five. So when they say that one side of the DNA runs from the five prime to three prime direction, what they're really saying is if you look at, the, and it's actually the left side of the DNA that's always the five to three side, if you look at all the deoxyribose molecules on that side, they're always gonna be face up. You're gonna see, they're gonna look like this. And if you count the carbons, it's always gonna be a carbon, a five prime carbon above the three prime carbon. In other words, this is carbon one, two, three, four, and in the upper corner is a carbon number five. And in the bottom corner, if you were to go all the way down, the bottom carbon is always going to be a carbon number three. If you look at the other side of the DNA, the three prime to five prime side, you're going to see that all the little pentagons are upside down. So if we number the carbons the same rule clockwise from the oxygen, this would be carbon one, two, three, four, and this down here will be carbon five. So the right side of the DNA is called the three prime to five prime side because carbon number three is above carbon number five. In the uppermost corner is a, is a three prime carbon and in the lower corner is a five prime carbon. So let me show you 
Um, oops, sorry about that. So let me show you. This is showing the same thing. So the numbering of carbons is clockwise from the oxygen. If we go to the picture here, so let me show you this one. This one's a little easier to see. So here's my pentagons. That's my sugar. If I number the carbons clockwise from the oxygen, it's one, two, three, four, and the one that's in the topmost corner is a carbon number five. And the one that's in the bottommost corner, down here as well, is a carbon number three. So this side is called the five prime to three prime side of the DNA. If I go to the other side and count clockwise from the oxygen, it's gonna be one, two, three. It's a carbon number three in the uppermost corner, four, five. It's a carbon number five in the lower corner. And this last carbon here is a, is a carbon number five. So this is called the three prime to five prime side. So, which might seem really irrelevant right now, but when DNA copies itself, this is gonna be significant. Because it turns out that it's sort of like, one of these ways would be sort of like reading a book forwards, and trying to read it the other way would be sort of like trying to read a book backwards. So in other words, it, DNA can only be built in one direction. It can't just go either way. So we're gonna talk about that in a minute, but that kind of gives you a idea, an idea of how the carbons are numbered and why they're called anti-parallel if you didn't learn that before. Okay, um, so our, our other goal today is to talk about how DNA makes copies of itself, and that's called replication. Um, so that happens in S of the cell cycle. If we go all the way back to mitosis, you may remember that I told you that chromosomes went from looking like a stick to looking like an S during S. So what's really happening during S synthesis of the cell cycle is that you started with one long strand of DNA, technically it's all coiled up, and at the end of S, that strand of DNA has basically made a copy of itself, so now you have two strands connected by the centromere. That's technically what's happening during S of the cell cycle. The DNA is literally making an exact copy of itself. Yes, that's coming up. That is the semi-conservative model, yes. So the model of how DNA makes copies of itself is called the semi-conservative model. Um, there's an experiment that I'm gonna talk about in a second that was done that um, was to show the semi-conservative model, but in essence, here's what the semi-conservative model says. That what actually happens when DNA makes copies of itself is the original DNA, I'll draw it in red, opens up, basically splits in two. So we started with this one DNA, it opens up, and then nucleotides that are sort of floating around, you can imagine that there's actually little nucleotides floating around in the nucleus, little A's and T's and G's and C's, those come in. So if this has an A, what's gonna match to it? A T, I heard somebody say G, I'm gonna ignore the G. How about if it had a C, then a G? So a new, uh, basically a new side, a match, will be built to this one, and a new match will be built to this one. And this is why the two chromatids are exactly identical to each other, because they're coming from the same template. The DNA basically just opens, matching nucleotides come in, and you end up with two strands. So why is this called semi-conservative? Because it, each fully built new DNA consists of one original strand and then one new strand. One old strand, one new strand. So it's not completely conservative. Completely conservative would be if the original strand, if I go to the photocopy machine and I put in my paper, what comes out is a copy. My original is completely intact, my copy is completely separate. That would be sort of what would happen if replication was conservative. The original DNA would stay intact, the new one would be like a photocopy of it. Instead, it's only semi-conservative because the original splits in half. So the final new, two new DNAs that are made consists of one old strand and one new strand, and so that's why we call it the semi-conservative model. So what I want to explain to you is the experiment that Messelson and Stahl did to show that replication was semi-conservative. Any of you need this before I... Yeah, I'll wait a second. No problem. Right, 
right? So in other words, basically think of this as cracking in half and each one getting a new, sort of like if I took an original and I ripped it in half and gave each person half and then they had to draw in the second half. In essence, that's what's happening. So we got one old strand and one new strand. Are we good now? Should we move forward? Okay, so let me show you their experiment. Um, this is actually a picture of what happens. So here's your original, they have it in dark blue. When it splits in half, the only thing that's gonna match up here is, is going to be a complement. So this is an A, a T's gonna come in. If this is a C, a G's gonna come in. And you're gonna get two strands that are identical to each other. And each consists of one old and one new. Okay, so here's their experiment. This is, in my opinion, harder than the other two experiments. Just letting you know, to understand. So. They grew E. coli bacteria in what's called heavy nitrogen. It's an isotope of nitrogen, and it has a particular weight. So if I was to put my E. coli, break them up with a chemical, put their DNA into a centrifuge, and spin it around, what would happen is the DNA would sink. Imagine there's liquid in here, by the way. This is filled with fluid. This is not empty. But my DNA, because it was made with this particular nitrogen, nitrogen 15, would sink to a certain level. If instead I had DNA in an E. coli instead that was grown in nitrogen 14, it would sink to a, a different level. It wouldn't sink as low because it wouldn't be as heavy. There's no other difference in the DNA other than how much it weighs. Again, it would be sort of like if I go to a copy machine and I have a flyer that's made out of poster board and I make a photocopy of it. The paper that comes out is going to have the exact picture as my flyer, but it's going to weigh less because it's a piece of paper versus a poster. So imagine that they grow this DNA in, in a bac the bacteria. It contains a nitrogen that makes the DNA heavier than normal. That way they can track it because it'll be heavy. So what they do is they let the bacteria make a copy of itself, and then um, they replace the DNA, I should say before they let it make a copy of itself, with a lighter, a lighter version of nitrogen. Here's what basically would happen. Imagine they had two ideas of what might be going on. One was that DNA replication was conservative, meaning sort of like me going to the copy machine. If DNA replication was conservative, then this would be my original DNA grown in nitrogen 15. It would have a certain weight. We're just talking about how much it weighs. My new DNA would come in and be built using this as a model. It would make a photocopy of it, but this one would be made of nitrogen 14 because nitrogen 14 is all they provided it with to grow. That was the only you know food available, so to speak. When I put this in the centrifuge, and again, there's some liquid in here, the, and I spin it around, this would be really heavy. So I would get one band down here for my heavy DNA, and I would get a second band up here for my lighter DNA, and that would show that replication was conservative, that the original one was still intact, and then the new one that was made was lighter. But what if instead replication is semi-conservative? Let me show you what would happen. Teachers, the students part of this introduction is from the sorrows. It's from the sorrows. Please report to the main office. It's from the sorrows to the main office. All right. So instead, if DNA replication is semi-conservative, here's what's going to happen. My original DNA is going to open up. This was made of nitrogen 15. The new, the new side is going to be built, but it's going to be built out of what's available, which is nitrogen-14. If I spin this in a centrifuge, what should I see? Here's the level for 15, here's 14, right in the middle, and that's what they saw. They literally saw one band in the middle that showed it was semi-conservative, that the band consisted of one heavy and one light. Instead of there being a, a heavy one and a light one, there was one band in the middle that was basically this DNA that consisted of half heavy and half light. And that's how they showed the semi-conservative model. Now they actually let this go one more generation. And if you do that, you'll actually see that this will separate again. And you're gonna get basically this. You're gonna get still one band in the middle and then the two new ones that form will actually form another band at the top. You would never get a band at the bottom again. So this is how they prove semi-conservative replication. There's a picture on the next slide of it. Um, you don't have to know cesium chloride. It's just the chemical they use to break up the bacteria. 